So good morning. I want to introduce Professor Robin Kravitz from the University of Illinois. And she is well known in the uh, networking community uh, for some of her work on protocols and also low power design in the past. And she is also uh, the proud uh, recipient of one of the FRAs from Google Research. And today she's going to talk on Internet of Things. Actually, I think actually, they can hear. Oh, they can hear. I, we checked it. Actually, they can hear from all over. Yeah. There might be a. Anyway, thank you, Roy. And, and actually, I uh, had the pleasure of spending a year here working with Roy as a, a Google faculty. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Visiting, uh, visiting faculty. Visiting faculty. So, uh, but that was about two years ago. And so, um, Actually, while I was here, we spent a lot of time talking about IoT and looking at some of the changes that's been going on in the world. And a lot of this work has uh, developed since I came back from uh, my, my time here. And the focus of my research recently has been trying to understand what's going on in the space of IoT. And, and um, you know, IoT means lots of different things to lots of different people. There's, there's no one definition, which makes it very challenging. I look at this from the perspective of connecting users to the information around them, okay? But uh, that is very challenging and a very broad space that we live in. So the dream that people have come up with over the years has been this idea of this world around us is smart, whether it's smart homes or smart cities. I mean, I, I love using the, the Jetsons as this old example that's, you know, from the 60s of people who envisioned what could we do if we could talk to the space around us? And we're finally at that space. <laughs> so uh, I have st text underneath the people's faces, and I apologize ahead of time. Uh, next time I'll, I'll make sure the text is higher. Um, and we now have taken that and, and trying to realize these dreams of smart homes and smart cities. But are we really there yet? And there's this big challenge of trying to understand how to make that happen. But people have talked about IoT in the space of home automation. How do I control everything around me? Everything from the lights to my TV to my refrigerator, toaster, to uh, the temperature control, water monitoring, all of it, to manufacturing. All of this encompasses IoT. How do they do inventory control and manage everything around them? Uh, energy management. There are people who talk about IoT in the context of understanding the grid and managing the energy uh, usage uh, of everybody around them. Retail, where you walk around a smart store and interact with that space and hopefully get a better services from the store by the IoT space that you get. And of course, healthcare. And healthcare is one of you know, the space where there's a lot of interesting problems going on and the technology is changing a lot. What I want to focus on today is, oh, and transportation. So the biggest challenge here is, you know, now we've got smart cars, we've got smart little little de medical devices, we've got big robots in manufacturing, we've got my home devices in um, in my house, I've got the energy grid. Okay, you cannot solve a problem for IoT across all of this. There is no one solution for everything. So I think all of us have to. They step back a little bit and try to understand what space we're trying to solve the problem of IoT in. Um, um, and please just stop me and ask questions along the way. This is not meant to be a lecture. <laughs> but I want to focus on one very specific thing. So if we look at the difference between something like home automation and retail, the spaces that we're operating in are very different. Home automation is a very private space. I'm in my home, all the devices belong to me, I'm interacting, and everything is designed around satisfying the needs of me and the other people who live in my home. But the problem space is all uh, within the domain of devices I own and I manage and are working for a, a common goal for a particular family. If you look at some place like retail, this is a public space. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of people walking around interacting with multiple stores and multiple interests from different uh, organizations and uh, corporations that 
are very different than the solutions that we need in home automation. Okay, we can think about things like smart shopping, right? Where the user is looking at uh, is trying to get product information or recommendations about the things they might want to buy. You know, as I'm walking around the store, I might get some information from the products that are even targeted coupons for me because I'm a frequent buyer in the store that you wouldn't get because you're not. Okay, or recommendations from friends of mine that have gotten things in the store, or recommendations from people like me. All of these things are interesting problems that challenge IoT in the public space. And it turns out the store has just as much vested in this. They want to know things, they want to do things like automated inventory control or manage the incentive programs that give me the targeted apps. And all of this hopefully can be done by instrumenting the space around us. But this is a very much a public space. I'm interacting with things owned by somebody else that may have different requirements for me than they would have for you. So the other scenario that we've been focusing on has been a, more like a smart gym, where we want to do things like socialize or personalize or incentivize the en exercise that people are doing by having them interact with the machines around them or interact with the people near them. So this benefits everything from the people doing the workouts to the owners of the gym or even the trainers who are helping, who in this case might be even the third party. For this particular talk, I'm going to focus on uh, the smart shopping scenario. If you have any questions or you'd like to talk to me about our smart gym scenarios, I'm happy to do that after the talk. Um, because there's different, you can imagine there's, there, there's a lot of overlap in the problems that we solve, but uh, the challenges and the main goals are going to be slightly different. Okay, so I said IoT is different in private versus public spaces, and my argument was that for the most part, when you're in your home, you're going to be operating with your mobile device, probably talking to a home gateway. And that home gateway is going to manage the devices in your home. Okay. You own the gateway, you own the devices, and the solution is going to, uh, the, the goals of this whole system are going to satisfy your needs. When we're looking at the retail space, while there may be some type of gateway that operates and manages the devices, that first of all, that gateway is owned by the company. And second of all, I might actually be uh, um, interacting directly with some of the other devices, not necessarily just the gateway. So I, I'm not only interacting with the, the store's gateway, but the store's devices that they've deployed throughout the system. Can you yeah? describe what the gateway is of so the gateway may actually just be in the cloud somewhere. So let's say I'm walking through a store and I decide that I um, want to, I'm going to use Cheerios later, I don't know why I decided to do this. Um, I want to buy some Cheerios. Uh, I might ping the gateway in the cloud, find out some more information about that, and maybe get a, a, a coupon or something from that. So in some sense, Probably the, gate, the, the gateway is the component, the store's backend that manages its devices, right? And so part of the coordination and uh, configuration of all these devices needs to be managed by the store itself, not by me as a user, right? So all of that component has to be on the backend. But as I'm walking through the store, I'm going to be interacting with the beacons that are around me that the different products are going to be sending out. And some of those beacons may be targeted. They may be uh, only uh, decodable by me because they're encrypted in a certain way. Any number of things can happen. And so there's lots of different ways you might interact with different components of the system. And the other thing that, that I think is very different between the private space and the, the public space is sheer scale. You know, if you walk into a store, you're probably going to be bombarded with hundreds, if not thousands, of devices in that space. Where in your home, while you might have a lot, I don't think the scale is going to be quite as hard, quite as high. So the two things that I want to talk about today are privacy, trying to understand how we can maintain the user's privacy as we interact in this space with the um, the companies or the store's devices, and understanding how we can look at scalability to enable um, effective 
communication and services in these domains. So I'm going to talk about two particular projects that we've been working on. The first one focuses on privacy. The second one focuses on scalability. Some of the back end, but also how the user is going to interact with the, with the devices themselves. So from the privacy perspective, I want to go back to our first goal of what we were talking about in terms of IoT. I want to connect the user to the information around them. And that means, for the most part, I want to enable better recommendations. I want to enable better services. And something else that I don't remember what it was, because it's not on the screen. <laughs> what did that say? Oh, and better experiences. <laughs> and better experiences for the user. Um, and to do so, I need to get information from the user. OK, so that was my vision. The reality of what happens when we instrument the world around us with any type of devices is that as we move around, we interact with the spaces around us. So you know, I've walked to the bridge. Now I'm on a cable car. I'm going to leave some breadcrumbs behind about what I have, where I've been, and who I am. And these breadcrumbs allow people to identify, or adversaries, or anybody, to identify who we are and where we've been. Okay. So the biggest challenge that we have to balance is if we don't leave any breadcrumbs, nobody knows anything about us, and nothing can be done to help us improve our services and our experience. But if we leave the wrong breadcrumbs, everybody's going to know who we are, and we're going to ex have exposed everything about ourselves. So the one of my, my favorite examples here is this was actually already a couple of years ago now, and it was, they shut this down. But in New York City, some people went around, and they put beacons in the old phone booths in New York City. First question I got there was, there are really still phone booths in New York City? But they don't have phones in them anymore. They just have beacons in them now. And what would happen is, as the, uh, as the users walked around New York City, these beacons would ping the people's phones and track them as they're walking around the city. I'll explain a little bit more, actually, how this works, uh, uh, the specifics of how BLD makes this work a little bit later. But essentially, if anybody can track me, nobody's going to use IoT if you can't provide some type of privacy. And the biggest problem, actually, was this was built on top of a technology that opened that hole. There was nothing any particularly wrong with the technology. There was nothing wrong with what they were doing. They were actually using BLE in the way it was supposed to be used. But it opened up a huge hole in exposing information about people. OK, so the, the if, nobody, if we don't provide privacy, nobody's ever going to use IoT. So one of the first questions I always get is, why would anybody want to expose anything about themselves ever? Maybe we just keep everything private to ourselves and never tell anybody anything. First of all, we're humans, and by nature, we want to tell people about ourselves. <laughs> and in, in this human nature, we also end up getting things back by telling things about ourselves. So, if technology gives us the ability to collect information about people, whether it's personal information or hobbies or preferences or shopping history, we get more information back. I mean, who will know this? Do you have questions now? Yes. Um, can you just compare and contrast this a little bit with both the revolution? One of the scenes the same, right? People are scared that they're going to be trapped all over the place because of the critical numbers, I guess. We are. Yeah. Um, so how does this compare to that? It actually makes it even worse because with a credit card, I walk into a store and the store knows what I bought because they can link my purchases to my credit card. Right. Um, if I walk into a store now and it's instrumented with information, uh, if they could tell that I stood in front of the soup aisle for 10 minutes, that I picked up something put it back, picked up something else, put it back, and finally bought the one thing. And they can use that information to determine how they should stock their, their stores. They can use that information to send me better ads. Oh, you like Campbell's Soup, so I'm going to give you better ads for Campbell's Soup. Or even the other way, oh, you picked up my soup. Maybe if I give you a, a coupon for that soup, you'll buy it. Or so you can, you can you know, dig deep into a user's behavior and 
get much more fine-grained information than just what they bought and went and what they find. Credit cards is a one-time stamp, right? The also, the, the credit card is under user control. I could choose to use cash if I want to. That's wanted. true. And I, and I know I'm doing it, but I don't know I'm doing this. Exactly. That's true, too. So the credit card, if I, if I want to get away from that, somebody knowing what I'm really doing, I don't use a credit card. But again, people don't do that. They use their, you know, so my, my argument is that how many people here have a, a frequent shopper card at their supermarket because they get gas back? I get my, I get free gas all the time, you know, or that you have an easy pass. So I don't think there's toll around here. You know, they have an easy pass because you want to go through the toll test. All of these things make our conveniences better at the cost of exposing where we've been and what we've done. And so by nature, we do these things. So what we want to do is make sure that we do them right and not do them wrong. Right? And because this technology is ubiquitous in the space around us, if we do it wrong, it's exposing a lot of information about us. More and more than what we'd like, probably. Okay, so if I'm, certainly if I'm, sh if I'm sharing information with the space around me, I can improve my personal experience. But actually, I even want to share information with my friends, right? I could get better recommendations for my friends. I could get their shopping history and see what they bought when they made, you know, their famous cake and uh, know what brands they like and what they don't like. So sharing information with friends is just as important as sharing information with the environment around us. So, but maybe I'm willing to share information differently with different components of this whole system. So if I walk around blindly and I have everything open, and I'm, you know, uh, everybody can find out everything about me, that's bad. But if I shut everything down and nobody can find out anything about me, that's just as bad. The stores, like I said, are just as interested in all of this. You know, they want to get, uh, they want to increase their clientele. They want to deal with better inventory control, special deals. So their benefit of making sure that they do this right, so the people use the IoT infrastructure is just as important. But this requires access to user data. Like I said, if you shut down that access, you can't get anywhere. So what we want to be able to do is bridge this gap using IoT. But like I said, if everybody could see everything all the time, I have no control of where my data is going. So what I'd like to be able to do is, I don't know if you can quite see it, but those arrows are different colors. I want to be able to control what information I expose to other users, to friends, or to other business owners under my control. Okay, so user management is our key component here in understanding how we want to expose the information and what benefits we get from exposing that information. Okay, so if we design this ecosystem from the very beginning, there's lots of pieces that we need to figure out. We need to deal with context discovery, you know, where am I? And that answer of where am I may determine what I do. So what store am I in? What coffee shop am I in? What museum am I in? Uh, and then once I figure out where I am, I want to decide what identity I should use in that environment. And our argument is that we should have location-based identities that are determined by the user. So when I go to a coffee shop, I can decide that I'm French Rose 99. Okay. Maybe when I go to a coffee shop, I always use French Rose 99 as my ID, but not Rob. And so there's no way for them to maybe not no way. I never throw challenges like that to privacy people. <laughs> but there's it's challenging for them to tie my French Rose 99 to my real personal identity. But by exposing information that every time I go to the coffee shop that I'm the same one, maybe they know what I want. Maybe they'll give me discounts because I'm a frequent user or recommend new things that I like or give me free music, any of those things. So what identity should I expose? And like I said, so this is the same thing. Uh, so what we're recommending is location-based pseudonyms. So I can use the same one. I can either use the same one in the store, or I can use different ones across different stores. And I'll give some examples of that in a second. By managing these identities, I can decide what information I share with who based on the identity. So if I have coffee buddies, I can share my coffee ID with them, and they'd only know who I am when I'm in that coffee shop. 
Okay. And we need to do this in a secure way that one prevents impersonation. I don't want somebody else to walk up and say they are French Roast 99. <coughs> and also, I don't want them to be able to say, I'm French Roast 99, give me all the coupons and the discounts that that person was supposed to get. So we want to do this in a, in a secure and private way. So um, our system is something called incognito. So incognito is this ecosystem where users decide what they want to share. It's kind of what I've been talking about already. And the users use these context-based identities that in each environment. And how you control your identity determines how much you expose. So we want to do this and understand that the technology we use is going to impact everything that we're talking about. So let's say for this uh, system, we have a Wi-Fi connection to the infrastructure. And we have Bluetooth low energy connections to uh, beacons around us, to the environment. Okay. So we need to secure and manage everything in the context of both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and BLE. So uh, the identities that we have work a number of different ways. We can share. So we have to understand that if I walk into Target and I use my, or I walk into the coffee shop, so this is what I have, and I say I'm Fred Trust 99, and there's another instance of this coffee shop, I have to assume that they're going to share the information about me across these two organizations. And the only way for me to not, to prevent that would be use different identities in different instances of the same coffee shop. Right? Um, but it's only to my benefit. I mean, it doesn't really make sense to say, why not share information in all the Starbucks, right? Um, but I can also say that I want to have one identity for every coffee shop that I go to. It doesn't matter which brand. And then I get to share my information across all coffee shops. The thing about all of this is it's user control. And the users can decide how they want to use their identities. Okay. Or it could just be anonymous. Right? I could say, I don't want anybody to know anything about me. I'm going to put a random ID in every packet. Um, for every message, the user appears as somebody new. And the environment can't track you. And I guess if somebody's standing very close to you and they notice some anomalies of your signal, they can track you. So, you know, no tracking is, is always kind of challenging. And if I'm the only one here and they see a, a variety of IDs, they're still going to be able to track me. Um, but essentially, they're not going to be able to tie this to any particular identity. Uh, so every time I show up to somebody new for every message. But that no tracking from the environment means I get no information back from the environment as well. So we have the one time where there's a random identity per session. So if I walk into the coffee shop, today I'm French Rose 99, tomorrow I'm French Rose 300. Okay. And there's no connection between the two. So no connection between multiple sessions from the same user. Yeah, hey, sorry. So, uh, okay, so so again, you know, the, if I'm in, if I'm not in, an, if I'm in anonymous mode, they're not going to know how long I've sat. Okay. They'll know that I bought, you know, a bottle of water, but they won't know that I've sat there for three hours nursing my bottle of water. Well, they, they can know this because they can. Not, not if they have, not if you're anonymous. Because it's changing every packet that you have. Every interaction that you have has a new identity. And this is pushed down, and I'll talk about it in a minute. It's pushed all the way down to the max. So they can't even track your device. Um, so they will know that somebody bought a bottle of water at 3.15, but they won't be able to connect that to how long you have been with Answer your question. Well, so for the next one, the one time, they can track me for that one use. Or they could track me for uh, per environment. Right? I can say that every time I go to the same coffee shop, I use the same um, well, But there's no connection to the same user in a different environment. And this was very important because we were talking about things like if Target and Walmart could collude about information about me. You know, coffee shop is just a simple example. But I don't want Walmart knowing what I'm buying at Target, and I don't want Target knowing what I'm 
buying at Walmart. And uh, if they could, if they could co combine that information, that's very powerful for them. I want to be able to prevent that. Um, I could, like I said, cross domain. I have a bunch of independent coffee shops. Why not let them form an organization and track information? I could have a global ID if I wanted, but that seems kind of dumb because that exposes everything about me. <clears throat> so uh, there's nothing stopping you from doing that, but once that's out there, it's out there. You can't change it anymore. Okay. So the challenge of all of this and what I was hinting at before is that how do we do this? How do we make this happen? I mean, I want to say, okay, I walk in. I'm a one-time user. But my device is, is broadcasting things all the time. And all transmissions contain the identity of the device, my Mac backups. So if I don't change anything about the way the devices work, no matter what I do, you can identify who I am by just simply tracking my Mac address. Okay, and that's exactly what happened with these, uh, with the identification by in New York. What happened was the, the beacons were sending out messages, your phone was responding, with a MAC address. It didn't necessarily know who you were, but it could track the same MAC address walking through New York. Okay. So there are solutions. You can cycle through random MAC addresses, and this essentially puts you in the anonymous mode. Right? But then nobody knows who you are, for better and worse. Okay. And you're not able to gain any benefit from any interactions with your friends or the stores. I could add my ID into the message and with the random MAC addresses. But with something like BLE, which has a very small uh, data payload, I'm using my very limited 31 bytes of data in my BLE message with a random MAC address and then uh, an ID. So what we do is we use user, ran user managed MAC addresses. And the nice thing about Bluetooth, about BLE, is that it allows you to change your MAC address. You have to remember that this actually has to be done for BLE and Wi-Fi. Because if I don't change my Wi-Fi MAC address, everybody knows who I am. Anyway. Most of what I'm talking about today is going to talk, focus on how to do this for BLE. It's actually more challenging to do it for Wi-Fi because anytime you associate with a, um, with a base station, you now have one, you're associated because of one MAC address. You can take these solutions that we're talking about for BLE and apply them to base stations as well. It's going to make the base stations a little more complicated because they're going to have to track the MAC addresses. Okay, so both addresses. So for, for our initial approach to incognito, we set the MAC address to the CID. So now you're walking around and when you're in a store, you're, you're advertising your identity and your, your hat. Nobody, only, the only thing they know is what you're telling them. So we started with letting the user register with the organization through the back end, through Wi-Fi or the cloud, whatever. And what they register is their ID, uh, what their MAC address is their ID, and they exchange a, um, uh, they give the, the cloud, the organization or the store, a, their public key and their CID encrypted with their private key. And I'm going to use this to be able to guarantee who I am. Right? So uh, now if I send the private key, if they decrypt the private key encryption, they're going to get my CID and they'll match. So now, and, and because they have my public key, I've given to this amount of band, later I can use it to decrypt my CID later. So when I'm sending a Bluetooth uh, message, I send, I set the MAC address to my CID. And I include a hash of a timestamp and an encryption of the timestamp. Okay. And they look up in their database and they say, okay, the CID maps, maps to this public key, and they can decrypt the timestamp and make sure that's correct. Okay. So they can guarantee that that's me. What this really does is it prevents impersonation. Because okay. otherwise, somebody, if I don't have that uh, timestamp in there, somebody could just take my CID, walk around, and pretend to be me. Okay, and they could lay a trail of memes around the environment. Um, the nice thing about this also, remember before I said I want to be able to share my information. I want to be able to say here, uh, 
go talk to Whole Foods and find out what I bought last time to a friend. But I don't necessarily want Whole Foods to know that we are friends. And I don't necessarily want Whole Foods to know who that other person is, and they shouldn't have to expose their identity. So what we do is we actually can hand, tell a friend what our identity is for a specific environment with the private key encrypted CID. Nobody else can create that, just me. And they can hand that now to the environment to get the history of information about, about me based on that identity. So essentially, they are impersonating me, but I let them do it. Okay. The nice thing about all of this is it gives control to the user. So if I decide that I, I'm going to use the same identity at um, Whole Foods for a month, and I say, after a month, I don't really want Whole Foods to know anything about me. I just throw that identity away and I start up with a new identity. <clears throat> and Whole Foods probably cannot connect those two people uh, unless they use intense data mining on shopping patterns. Okay. But, of course, this is very straightforward. There's got to be some challenges to make this work. Um, external apps could leak information. If I have you know, Whole Foods app on my phone, when I give Whole Foods access to all of my identities, that's going to be bad. So we're going to have to sandbox the, app, the IoT apps and manage the CIDs from the devices themselves, from the, 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 the device itself. So you can't allow the apps access to your particular um, identities. That's one thing that we're working on. We haven't finished building that yet. But what I want to focus on today is that this sounds great, but it turns out that the CID leaks more information than you realize. One, if I'm if I'm here, um, if I'm in one coffee shop and I step out of the coffee shop, or I'm very, or the two stores are very close together, um, even if I change identities when I move from one store to the other, the first store could have listened in on where I was, could have found out more information about me. Second, you can't see it here. But this is, there's a second person uh, snooping on a first person. So if I'm just standing there, I could snoop on you because I know your CID and I can watch where you've been. So we want to actually prevent this leak of information as well. And to understand why that gets leaked, or so, certainly we can get rid of that by using random MAC addresses. But the question is, can we use random MAC addresses in a smarter way that allows us to hide that, to close that leak, and still maintain the, the, this context-based identity as an identifier for the user? OK. To understand what's going on, I'm just going back. This is the original protocol, right? You have the registration and the advertising. And what's going on here is that this only prevents impersonation not tracking. Because I've got the CID and the encryption of the, of the CID here, uh, nobody else can create these messages from me. They can't impersonate me. But they can track me because there's nothing stopping anybody from hearing everything I go. That's one thing. The second problem, actually, is that private key encryption is very expensive. So if I only have to do that encryption once on my ID, that's OK. But if I have to do it for every changing MAC address, it's too expensive for most small devices. Even for phones, it starts getting expensive. Okay. So one, it's expensive. And the second, um, it actually creates very large packets to be able to use public key encryption. And BLE, like we said already, doesn't have very large packets. So we want to see if we can come up with a solution that doesn't use private key encryption that still allows us to cycle through our MAC addresses. OK, so when the users register with the environment, we're going to introduce a shared nonce. The shared nonce could be the original CID that they use, the, the main one that's only ever been exposed to the store during the original registration out of band. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to use a new MAC address for every message. So in this case, we can start by looking at using a change hash uh, of, the, of, the, of the CID with the shared nonce. Actually, that should say CID and shared nonce. Okay. Um, 
But the problem with standard things like AES and chain mode is that if any of those messages gets lost, you've lost everything past. So chaining says, basically says, I should get one message, and I, can, I need to get two more messages before I can decode it. Right? And then I have to get the next one to decode everything. And so because something like um, BLE is very unreliable, if I lose those messages, any of them, I lose everything forward into the future. Okay. So uh, that's what I just said. It's kind of hidden under there. Um, so what we can use is AES counter mode. And AES counter mode lets us put a counter in the message. So now I have a hash of the shared DOS with a counter, and I put the counter in the data. So that means that every message has the information it needs to be able to decrypt itself. I have the counter that I need, and I have the, the, the now I have the MAC address uh, that I can unhash and double check the counter against the counter and then I'm, I'm in good shape. Okay. So it, it breaks the connection that the chain modes have. Um, and this is essentially a self-synchronizing protocol that doesn't require any kind of synchronization amongst the different uh, transmissions. Okay. The problem is if I put an incremental counter in every message, one, two, three, four, five, six, you can just watch those and know exactly who I am because you've seen one, two, three, four, five, six. And you could, you know, maybe two people are doing it at the same time. You could probably unweave that. So we have to step one step further into this and look at the fact that the counter doesn't actually have to be a counter. It just has to be information. And it has to be unique information each time. So what we add into this now is a hash of the shared nonce with the counter. And now my MAC address is a hash of the shared nonce and a hash of the shared nonce in the counter. So here's my counter here, and my counter here. Okay. So this closes the door of, one, being able to track the counter, and two, being able to track the user's ID. Okay. Um, the nice thing about this is that if, if I'm working with very low energy devices, like maybe a watch or any other type of wearable, I don't have to, I can preload a bunch of um, sequences into the device so that they don't have to create those hashes on the fly. So if I, you know, if I pair my device with, in the morning, if I pair my watch with my phone in the morning, load a bunch of uh, 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 the hashed nonce with the counter for the day and give the watch enough, enough uh, um, counters to be able to use for the whole day. Okay. That's just going to depend on how much memory the different devices have, but it becomes a, a computation versus memory grade. Okay, so if we look at this, and just to, to close the door on this, so if you look at the original BLE packet, right, um, uh, this is just a straight uh, standard way of looking, at, of looking at BLE. What's exposing, all of these red things expose information about the device. The address, application data, and the device ID, even the, t the transmit power can expose information. So the first thing we did was replace the device ID of the transmit power with the AES counter. Okay. And we encrypted the application data. And you can put anything you want in there. If you need the transmit power, you can put it back in the application data if you need anything else there. But it secures it now. Because the counter exposed information, we hash the counter, and then finally we hash the hash. We hash the, the, the shared knots, the, the vector there, visualization vector, to get the address. And now I have something that plugs all the holes in the BLE address. That's why I'm saying in, in, you can use similar techniques for Wi-Fi, but uh, it's going to have to be different because this is specific to the way that uh, BLE uses its advertising. Okay. So in the end, oops, we have unique MAC addresses, only identifiable by the IoT infrastructure, because I've, I've uh, um, uh, registered with the infrastructure, given them my starting point, and now they can track each other. And there's no public key cryptography, 
and it's lost color. So now, nobody can track me. Nobody knows who I am because I'm using a unique address all the time. So essentially, to anybody who doesn't know how to unhash my address, I'm in anonymous mode all the time. Except the place where I am, I've given them permission to say, here, this is who I am. So I've now cut out that hole of anybody being able to snoop on me and having to worry about when I walk from one store to the next that they'll be able to know that every time I go to you know, Whole Foods, I go to the CVS next door and buy something else. They can't make that connection anymore. So that uh, is, our, is our big piece on understanding how to maintain privacy from the bottom up in IoT infrastructure. So if we can provide this privacy, maybe people will actually use it. So that's our, our take on it. That's all I'm going to talk about for this particular piece. I don't know if anybody has any particular questions. Because I said I want to talk about privacy and I want to talk about scalability. So um, the second part for scalability comes from the fact that if we go, we, we stick to this smart retail space, right, where we're using technology to enhance the user's experience, right? So let's say we're walking through the store and my phone is trying to do product identification and it's trying to get directed coupons and all these discounts and Every, every product is advertising some information. You know, there are thousands, if not millions, of products in any given big store. Okay. And if everything's broadcasting all of the time, your devices are going to get overwhelmed, the channel's going to get overwhelmed, and we're not going to be able to hear anything ever. So we won't be able to do product detection. We'll have immense channel contention. What we want to do, or what we have done, and we've built this, is uh, created a localized IoT hub, okay? And this is the store's infrastructure here. This is not my infrastructure. This is kind of on the other side, okay? And it allows the user to talk to the hub or even if they want to get information from the devices and let the hub control what's going on and what the particular devices are actually advertising, okay? So um, the other nice thing about this is by allowing the hub to talk to the devices, we've actually created a way to do um, automated inventory control. And not only automated in inventory control, but automated labeling if you have smart labels on all your shelves. So for example, you know, there are smart labels out there, but you have to go in, you, know, you, you put them on, you go in and you scan something, and you have to manually change these things. What we'd like to be able to do is uh, let the IoT infrastructure set what those labels are going to be instead of having somebody to go in manually. You know, our favorite is you know labeling is very uh, error prone. You know, this uh, it was rolled back from 427 to 1197. Probably user error, right? But we have uh, what we want to do is automate the label on the shelf based on all the products that are around. It. And so the nice thing about that is if I have some products. Uh, if they get rearranged by the users over the course of the day, the labels will still match what's sitting in front of them. Instead of my label for, you know, Coke, I accidentally, you know, having some Sprite in front of it, it still says Coke there, right? You want that to switch to, say, Sprite, okay? So the problem that we need to be able to deal with is what should the label display, okay? And our argument and the whole system that we've built says the label should display what the nearest object is or the nearest product because otherwise it's going to be confusing to the to the person shopping okay if we're going to do this can we just use standard ranging based wireless signal strength localization and the answer is that given the scale of everything being so tight it's actually not the right approach i don't need to know exactly where things are Absolute location is not necessary. I don't have to know that this bottle is on this shelf in this place. What I need to know is what's closest to the label that I'm using. Okay, so I need a nearness ordering. I need to order what's closest to me. And then pick the thing that's closest to me and go from there. Okay. So our labels look at this and say, what product is closest to me? Okay. If 
you're going to do this, we definitely have to look at the what technology to use. And obviously, I'm going to say DLE because that's why I've been talking about this whole thing. But you can look across the whole space of things. The reason that we chose BLE is that, one, the radios, one, are on smartphones. So if I'm going to be using any kind of phone-based technology, that's good. Um, they're very easy to acquire. They're low energy, and they're cheap. And the question I always get here is, why not just use RFID? And the challenge is, if I wanted to, let's see, where is this picture here? This one. If I wanted to put a, a smart label in every one of these places, these would all have to be RFID readers, and they're very expensive, right? Where if I just wanted to put a BLE reader radio in each one of these, it's not nearly as expensive. So uh, doing the nearness sorting isn't quite as easy as it sounds. We could do long-term averaging of RSSI values, uh, received signal strength values. They're actually useless. If I, if I average them over a long term, there is fading that goes on in the channel. And you're essentially averaging that fading and getting a, a pretty meaningless value. Okay. The second thing is uh, I could do instantaneous values, but you can see instant, instantaneous values are actually pretty noisy too. And they don't always work. It turns out that uh, short-term averaging, if I just pick a, what did we pick? Uh, 500 milliseconds. This actually gives us a good average. It, it's within the, the window of um, the changes in the channel. So the, so the long-term feeding hasn't been, isn't going to affect the short value. And it lets you average out a couple of anomalies. Okay. And as you can see, I mean, I'm, I'm just, uh, these are some experiments that we run on. I don't really have time to explain all the experiments. But you can see that the that if this is different tags, we've actually created a really good nearest sorting, and the green one is closest. Where before, right, it's all over the place. Okay, it would be very difficult for me to pick which one is closest, and it would change a lot. Okay. And so the idea here is that if I do these short-term averaging instead of long-term averaging, I'm actually getting these windows, and that each point I can say, okay. This is what's closest to me. And it works very well. Okay. So what we built <laughs> is we built our little uh, BLE labels here. They change color depending on which um, color. Uh, I think we had that's soda, that's a juice. I think we had Gatorade in our last one. Um, and these little guys here are BLE receivers. And each bottle has a BLE transmitter on the bottom of it. And as you move the bottles around, the uh, label changes based on the color of the soda that's in front of it, or the drink that's in front of it. Okay. Um, this, yeah? How about how expensive are the BLE tags? They're expensive right now. OK, so certainly this is not something that you could deploy right away. But um, I, I think they could come down soon. There's a lot of um, energy harvesting. Um, and it turns out that. They actually don't need to broadcast as much as the green BLE. Uh, so it's going to have to depend on if more people want it, the prices are going to come down. I think currently Google is saying six dollars is the lowest we can buy. Yeah, but that's even better than it oh, yeah. was. Yeah, it's better than commercially, which is twenty dollars today. Yeah, you know the ones, these guys here, these are like forty dollars. The, the, little the little blue thing on top. Yeah, the blue thing on the bottom of the box. So that's going to have to get down to less than 10. So the question is, how are we going to do this? You know, uh, it has to be simple. Is it something that you know you can pull off a box? Is it something that's inside a box? Is it something that's on a label box? Like mm -hmm. Maybe you can use something to do that. But uh, this gives us another option for understanding how we do this. So. In a supermarket, it's definitely far more challenging mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. putting every product, you know, tagging every product in a supermarket. But I've talked to people in like already take tags off of stuff. And the tags that they use are all uh, the granularity that they're getting is not as good. So if we could put some DLE tags on them, they can get their top tickets. So it really is kind of
depends on the environment that you're looking at. I mean, an electronics store, you know, they can put something, so they can put something in the electronics, mm -hmm. they'll take it off the right? just go to a price point and just that. So, you know, for a cereal box, definitely needs to come down to the price, right? For uh, a DVD, a DVD. Did you do it through imaging? With, you know, it recognizes for a cereal box. Well, certainly you can do a lot with imaging. You, it's a lot harder to, um, you know, you have to cover the whole space. And you can track a person, uh, have to face recognition for every product. So think of the product. Oh, the product. recognize that that's a red bottle with this label, so. You certainly it's, could do some imaging of putting it in the group. Um, but so one of the things that, one of the problems that comes up, and then I'll, I'll finish up, um, is that if all of these devices are beaconing all the time, not only is it expensive, it's going to saturate the channel. So our, our hub actually is able to tell the duplicates that are not near to shut down. Okay, this is the algorithms that we're using for determining what, how frequently something should advertise. is something that we're working on right now. So if I can get it to the point where the back serial box only advertises every 10 minutes, every half hour. I mean, one, we're talking about human scale and inventory management. So if the back box only advertises even once a day, right, maybe that's not so bad, or every hour. The front boxes need to advertise more often. So uh, being able to reconfigure these when there are very dumb beacons that are just sending anything is actually, uh, you have to be very careful about how you make, uh, design the protocols for telling them to change something, because otherwise that change, that reconfiguration becomes so expensive that the batteries die. So we have to, there's some trade-offs there, and that's something that we're working on right now. Okay, so that actually is pretty good timing. Um, uh, that's two of the, pro two or two large products that, projects that we're working on in IoT in public spaces. And, you know, I think BLE is really, you know, the right place at the right time. Uh, somebody asked me, why are, you why are you putting all your eggs in the BLE basket? I said, well, you know, we've wanted to do many of these things for a long time. And people have talked about smart homes and smart spaces, but BLE has been the technology that has actually pushed it. Maybe something else will come along and we'll have to reconsider things, but right now that's what we have. And we need to make it work. We need to understand how the design of the protocol affects things we do. For example, the use of the MAC address or how frequently they configure themselves. That's, uh, that's my talk. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> yeah? Oh, I have a question. Uh, how do you see the social engineering aspect of the web on the web? So I'm, I'm certainly not a social engineer. You know, the question was about social engineering. Um, I, you know, I look at the world around us and I realize that people are social creatures and that we're not going to shut them down, right? We're, and somebody's, there are certainly paranoid people that don't want any information about them. But, you know, I tell my supermarket what I buy because I get five cents off a gallon on my gas. And I tell, you know, I buy at Amazon and they know what I buy and, you know, I get money back for it. You know, there's, there's, there's things. And I tell my friends that I like this restaurant. You know, recommendation systems are booming everywhere. And so I think human nature just shows us that that we are going to expose information. And what, as not being a social engineer, what I want to be able to provide are the tools for the social people to be able to say, okay, here's how you control the information that you expose in a very meaningful way. Okay. Controlled by the user. You know, I, maybe a different perspective than than a large company, you know, at the perspective of a user is I think I should be able to control my information, right? And, and hopefully we're giving some tools to be able to let the user control their information. Mm -hmm. I think you touched on it in comparisons uh, between the Well, actually, some of the problems are that the other approaches uh, are the computation's too high. I didn't go into this. We have another paper that talks about the computational component of it. Um, in the, it, it talks a lot about the 
actually the pre-processing of the of the hashed nonsense to because of that computer. So, so let me finish the sentence. We wanted to be able to do this, use the same techniques on on fitness bands, on smart shoes, on watches, on anything very low, low power. And so the original design for this was to try to keep processing really, really low. And two, most of the other approaches are come at it from the perspective of the cryptography community and didn't understand the fact that all the messages are getting lost. That, that when a message gets lost, it breaks the chain. So uh, the two, the addition of the low power computation and the counter-based encryption make this actually I think a major contribution to be being able to do better cryptography on wearables.